The space shuttle flew 135 missions over 30 years from April 1981 to July 2011. The program had many great moments, but also some really awful ones. The shuttle was a very complex system, and many, many things had to go right in order for the orbiter to fly safely. Besides the STS-51L and STS-107 disasters, there were several close calls that could have ended in tragedy. Let's talk about them. You may be wondering why I'm at Starbase and what does Starship have to do with Space Shuttle? Well, for 30 years, the Space Shuttle utilized thousands of thermal protection tiles in order to protect it from the searing heat of re-entry, and Starship will be doing just the same. Many of the issues that the shuttle had during its flying career centered around these tiles, which were hailed as a great advance compared to an ablative heat shield, but they did prove to be troublesome. Today, years after the retirement of shuttle, engineers building Starship, Dream Chaser, Starliner, and Orion have learned from and continue to study the marvel that was the shuttle's thermal protection system. And yet, even today, as Starship gets ready to go back to the moon and eventually to Mars, those tiles right there are proving to be troublesome. So what lessons can we learn? First up, STS-51F, main engine shutdown in flight. Turns out there could have been a Challenger disaster just six months before the actual Challenger disaster in July of 1985. STS-51F was a space lab research flight that had already suffered a main engine shutdown before liftoff earlier in the month. We have an RSLS Two. abort. We have an RSLS abort. We have an abort. After the issue had been resolved, Challenger and its crew were ready to try to launch again on July 29th. On this day, there would be another main engine shutdown, but after liftoff and well before the planned MECO, or main engine cutoff. Challenger lifted off into the afternoon sky, and the first few minutes of flight went as planned. The shuttle got past SRB SEP and past the negative return call where an RTLS abort to the Kennedy Space Center is no longer possible. Then at T plus five minutes and 45 seconds, a sensor registered a high engine temperature two minutes after the first sensor in the engine failed and shut down the number one engine, which is the center engine. However, that wasn't the end of the situation. Be copy, stand by. Flight photo abort ATO. Abort ATO. Challenger Houston, abort ATO. ATO. Abort ATO. The crew was told to abort to orbit, or ATO, meaning that they would use the two remaining shuttle engines to power the orbiter into a lower than expected orbit. If the failure had occurred just 33 seconds earlier, they would have had to land in Zaragoza, Spain. Thankfully, a quick thinking controller, Jenny M. Howard, saw that another sensor in a different engine was failing with an abnormal temperature reading and ordered an inhibit command to prevent losing another engine. I know we're single engine capability. Are we past tau, Fido? Yes, we are, but limits to inhibit. Challenger Houston, main engine limits to inhibit. Okay, inhibit. We'll keep a good close eye on it. Okay, which two systems are you having trouble with? It's the fuel turbine tent. That's what shut down the center. We've lost another one on the right engine. The A sensor's looking good. If that hadn't happened, Challenger might have had to end up ditching in the Atlantic Ocean. And there was no escape pole at the time, and it took the loss of Challenger two missions later to get it one installed, so it probably would have meant the loss of the crew. In the end, Miko of the two remaining engines occurred without further incident at T plus nine minutes and 41 seconds. After using its OMS engines, STS-51F was able to conduct its full mission of research using three Space Lab exposed pallets in the cargo bay. These pallets contained instruments for solar research, astronomy, plasma physics, and more, but there was no pressurized module like there had been on the earlier STS-9 mission. Challenger flew for eight days before landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And as it turned out, the engine failure was indeed caused by a bad sensor, not due to any issue with the engine itself. But this is far from the only space shuttle close call. Next up, STS-27. We almost lost Atlantis. After Challenger was lost on January 28, 1986, it took two and a half years before the shuttle was ready to fly again. The shuttle's return to flight on September 29, 1988, heralded America's return to human spaceflight. However, this return to flight very nearly ended on just the next mission after Discovery's October 3rd return to Edwards Air Force Base. On December 2nd, 1988, Shuttle Atlantis launched on its own return to flight, 
on a mission to deploy a secret Defense Department payload. STS-27 appeared to have a smooth ascent, except that some insulation came off the right-hand SRB nose cone. The shuttle got to orbit and started the sequence to deploy what turned out to be a radar reconnaissance satellite known as La Crosse, a satellite that could observe the Soviet Union and other priority targets even at night and through clouds. That deployment had its own drama, with some chatter going around about an emergency spacewalk that may or may not have been done. But Ultimately, it was successful. However, when the crew used the robotic Canadarm on the shuttle to inspect the tiles on the orbiter, they immediately saw something very worrisome. There was extensive damage to the black tiles on the lower leading edge joining the wing to the fuselage. However, when Mission Control analyzed the damage on the ground, they told the crew that it was not anything to be concerned about. The crew, led by legendary commander Hoot Gibson, did not buy what Mission Control was selling. Hoot told the crew that they should not die all tensed up, and that if he felt Atlantis pulling to the right during re-entry, that he would get on the radio and let Mission Control know what he really thought of their analysis. What a boss move. The time came for re-entry, and there was one whole tile missing in a critical spot. As Atlantis got deeper and deeper into the atmosphere, there was a possibility of a burn-through and a warpage of the orbiter's structure with catastrophic results. Except, the place where that tile was, was over a metal plate covering a communications antenna and that metal plate saved the orbiter and its crew. Another thing that saved the mission was that the gray leading edge carbon-carbon material protecting the orbiter from the very hottest temperatures was not damaged or penetrated by any debris. In the end, Atlantis landed safely at Edwards Air Force Base and Hoot Gibson's crew lived to tell their tale. However, the public had no inkling of what had happened on orbit as this was a secret DOD mission. And that was part of the problem. The downlink from the shuttle was encrypted due to the need for secrecy, and the resolution of the video beamed back was much lower than it normally was. Controllers based their analysis on this lower resolution video rather than the high resolution downlink normally used. You can bet that if this flight had been public, there would have been a lot more questioning of the space shuttle's safety. However, as it is, the full story of STS-27's near demise only came out much, much later. But that wasn't the final space shuttle close call. Let's now look at STS-93, the origin of Yikes, You Bet, Concur. Let's fast forward to the summer of 1999. We don't yet know the glory that is Futurama. We're all terrified about Y2K, and a second Austin Powers movie has come out, so we're all doing Austin Powers' voice in casual conversation again. The 20th century was coming to a close, and one of NASA's flagship great observatories was about to take flight. The Chandra X-ray Observatory had been attached to an IUS upper stage and loaded into the shuttle Columbia's cargo bay, prior to being flown to a highly elliptical 134,527 kilometer by 14,307 kilometer orbit around Earth. And it would be the heaviest payload any shuttle ever flew, counting the IUS upper stage, tipping the scales at 22,753 kilograms. I just have to take a moment here to mention how much of a crime it is that we're going to shut Chandra X-ray Observatory down. I, I don't even really know what to say. It's incredibly disappointing. Uh, write your representative if you live in the US. I don't, uh, it, it shouldn't happen. Anyways, let's get back to the subject. The flight was also notable for another reason. The commander was Eileen Collins, the first woman to command a shuttle crew. To mark this occasion, First Lady Hillary Clinton even flew to the Cape to watch the launch. Although a delay, one of several, forced her to fly back to DC. After a dramatic abort at T minus seven seconds on July 20th, the 30th anniversary of Apollo 11. 10, nine, eight, seven. Cut off. Cut off is given. NTD to CCD, but it's uh, We have uh, uh, hydrogen in the app. Columbia finally got to T0 on the night of July 23rd, 31 minutes past midnight. The main engines ignited and six seconds later, so did the SRBs. Columbia lifted off on its pillar of flame and cleared the tower, but there was a problem, a big one. Actually, more than one. Eileen Collins and her crew would soon face a situation that was more akin to one of their sims or simulations, but unfortunately, this was no simulation. Deep in the bowels of the number three or right main engine, a tiny gold pin, a pin used to plug a damaged oxidizer post, shook loose. The pin was ejected and struck the inside of the nozzle, which is lined with cooling tubes that carry liquid hydrogen, which keep the nozzle from being cooked and falling apart at the hands of the scorching rocket plume. The tiny gold pin nicked three of those cooling tubes as it fell, and that started another small hydrogen leak. But another problem reared its head five seconds after liftoff, also related to the main engines. An electrical short disabled two digital control units, the computers that run the main engine. To make things worse, these two units were in different engines. Each main engine had a primary and a backup digital control unit. 
the number one, or the center engine's primary DCU, and the number three, or the right engine's backup DCU, were disabled. So there were two main engines that were just one failure away from shutting down. One failure away from the shuttle having to perform a never-before-attempted RTLS, or return to launch site abort, that John Young, as a reminder, I always have to bring this up, said would take continuous acts of God interspersed with multiple miracles in order for it to be successful. After two minutes into flight, the solid rocket boosters separated, and the shuttle could turn to more benign abort modes, like the transatlantic abort in Spain or Africa, which is also known as TAU or later into flight, an abort to orbit, or ATO, like STS-51 did. But that doesn't mean it was time to relax. And remember that small hydrogen leak? The effects of it would rear their ugly head shortly. Columbia had passed the eight minute mark and was nearing orbit, but the main engines all shut down three seconds before they were supposed to. The hydrogen leak had caused the working right main engine controller to compensate by increasing the flow of oxidizer to that engine to make sure that it ran at a normal thrust. So engine three was running hot throughout ascent and the external tank was running low on liquid oxygen towards the end of flight. Shutting down the engines with too low an oxygen level could have catastrophically blown off the engine compartment and aft end of the orbiter. And there was understandable relief that that did not happen. Flight, it looked like it was a lock, slow level cut off. Copy. Confirm. Columbia Houston, we see a 15 foot per second underspeed. Ohms one, not required. Controllers captured the essence of this situation with a now infamous exchange you might remember from the NSF intro. And yeah, we saw the locks all of the sensors, all four of them go dry right at Miko and with the underspeed there, it looked like it was probably a locks level cut off. Yikes. You bet. Incur. We don't need any more of these. I don't think. After Columbia's problematic, near catastrophic ascent, the rest of STS-93 proceeded normally, and the crew was able to deploy the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Columbia landed safely at the Kennedy Space Center on the late evening of July 28th. After STS-93's return, the electrical short was found to be caused by wiring that had rubbed against an exposed screw head. All orbiters had their wiring inspected, and damaged oxidizer posts were now being removed from the engine instead of being plugged with those pesky golden pins. Next up, let's talk about STS-112, where we almost lost Atlantis again. On the afternoon of October 7, 2002, Shuttle Atlantis launched on an ISS assembly mission. STS-112, ISS Assembly Flight 9A, flew on a trajectory to the station and what appeared to be a picture-perfect launch into a beautiful blue sky. This was the next to last flight of 2002 with STS-113, another ISS assembly flight, scheduled for the following month, and STS-107, a long-delayed space hab research mission aboard Columbia, scheduled for January of 2003. However, there was a huge problem that was a warning signal, an unfortunate, unheeded warning signal, as the world would soon find out in the coming months. At T plus 33 seconds, while Atlantis was at 12,500 feet and flying at a speed of Mach 0.75, a large piece of foam fell off from the intertank bipod area and struck the left SRB's attachment ring to the external tank, leaving a noticeable dent in it. That piece of bipod foam, measuring 4 by 5 by 12 inches, or 240 cubic inches, came very, very close to striking a critical electronics box next to where the dent was. If that box had been hit with enough force to damage or destroy it, the SRB could have lost gimbal control or separation circuitry, which would have led to a bad day in NASA parlance. As we now know, if that foam had separated later into the flight, like, say, near Max-Q, it would have struck the SRB at a higher relative speed, and that higher relative speed would have been able to cause significant damage. After STS-112 completed its mission to deliver a truss segment to the ISS and landed safely, there was a high-level meeting regarding the foam strike issue. Fatefully, it was decided to fly STS-113 and STS-107, and the world saw what could happen with a bipod foam strike on February 1st, 2003. When STS-135, the final flight of the shuttle program, rolled around, the space shuttle was the safest it had ever been. With the data we have now, STS-1 had a 1 in 9 chance of ending in disaster and STS-135 had a far better probability of that not happening than any of the early shuttle flights. Even the best figure for the program was far worse than the 1 in 100,000 probability that NASA managers had believed before the STS-51L disaster in 1986. 
the true figure was calculated as one in a hundred immediately afterwards. And so much has been learned from the shuttle program, including from its close calls, but it remains incumbent on NASA and its contractors to learn from all of this, especially as we move into their ambitious plans for the 2020s and 2030s, including returning humans to the surface of the moon. Well, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching and let us know if there's anything you thought we should leave out in the comments or let us know if you liked the video. Either way, we'll see you guys on the next one.